Well, I'm live on YouTube, and for those that don't know who I am, you should know who I am if you're on my YouTube channel. My name's Paul Wilson, and uh, I'm an instructional designer uh, who's been using Adobe Captivate for about, gosh, I don't even know how long it is now. It's probably 12 years. And, um, you know, I've done uh, 170 YouTube video tutorials on, on the topic of uh, Adobe Captivate. And I thought I would just try something a little different. This is totally an experiment. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, anything special or, or whatever. I have two viewers. That's exciting. So, um, you know, hopefully a few people will, will jump on board and, and we'll maybe get some questions uh, going here. And I'll just take a look at... Again, this is all very new to me. So there is a, a group chat available. Uh, because this is the first time I'm using this, I'm not an expert on how to to use the group chat. But, you know, the idea is I'm going to broadcast for about an hour and, um, you know, maybe answer some questions or uh, tell you a little bit more about myself and some of the things that I've been doing. Um, I have no idea if the volume is any good. Can anyone get into the chat and, uh, and let me know if the volume is okay, just a, a thumbs up symbol or something like that? I think there is, if you actually click on um, the little happy face here, you can choose happy faces or frowny faces or things like that. So... <clears throat> I just want to get an idea if the volume is okay. Anyone can let me know. That would be greatly appreciated. Because otherwise, you're just looking at my pretty face. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, this is a, a reminder for for people like myself who are um, you know involved in this sort of thing. Uh, that you know you do get older older over time and I'm looking at my my image here I should turn off the image actually and just just talk to you guys um, but um, we're up to eight viewers now so that's good this of course will be recorded and uh, I may decide to um, put the video permanently on YouTube. If it's a complete disaster, you may never see this video again. I'm not sure. This is purely uh, an experiment. So hopefully it works well. Hopefully you guys like it. And, um, you know, it might be something that I add to my YouTube channel from time to time. Just uh, throw a few uh, video Q&As up. And, uh, you know, I seem to be getting some retweets of my um notifications with uh with regards to uh the q a with paul wilson so you know while i'm waiting to hear from you guys in any form of questions that you want i know the chat's available maybe i need to do something let's experiment here um Let me test something out here. I will type a message. Let's see if that shows up on, on your end. Hopefully it does. So in the meantime, maybe what we'll do is I can just start off by... Um, talking a little bit about myself. You know, many of you have probably been watching my videos for a while now, trying to bone up on on Adobe Captivate and, um, you know, get, uh, get some more experience and find out some of the things that you can do with it. I've been working with uh, Adobe Captivate now for a little over 10 years. It could be 11 or 12. I'm not really sure. Um, you know, it, it wasn't memorable at the time because it was very early days for me doing uh, doing e-learning. And uh, I, you know, I definitely 
uh, learned along the way. It wasn't something I took a, a formal course for. In fact, I got into instructional design quite by accident. Uh, I saw a posting for the retail company that I worked for, for an instructional designer, and I, I looked at the job description and um, saw that it was uh, things that I was interested in. It was things that um, that I would do normally when I was, um, excuse me, when I was, um, you know, as a store manager, I would help my staff learn about the products and how to sell and things like that. And as I'm reading this job description, I thought that sounds a lot like the stuff I like to do. Uh, when I was a retail store manager, I didn't like to do a lot of those those tasks, uh, you know, like managing your profit and loss statement and inventory management and disciplining staff and things like that. But the one thing I did like to do was to teach my staff how to be more successful or more effective as salespeople. And in, in one or two cases, I was very successful at teaching my staff um, those skills. And uh, so when the job description came up that they were looking for someone to be an instructional designer, someone who designed training from the ground up, I thought, that's what I do. I do it for fun. Uh, so I got into it, and uh, the rest is kind of history. Somewhere along the way, my, uh, my instructional design manager or learning and development manager uh, decided that we were going to transition from um, actually a, a webinar type thing that we did for, for our stores into more of an e-learning approach. And uh, the software we chose was Macromedia Captivate 2.0. And I remember this because I, I remember thinking that at the time, Macromedia Captivate 2.0 was like um, a poor man's flash or um, an easy flash, if you will. And, uh, you know, I was actually away the week that they did training for it. So I missed the training that um, um, that that the rest of the staff uh, um, got to partake in. And uh, so unfortunately, um, I was a little behind the eight ball on that. And uh, what ended up happening was that I did my own research and the internet wasn't great in those days and, and neither were the, the quantity of resources. Certainly no one had a YouTube channel with 170 different tutorials on Adobe Captivate. So I had to figure it out on my own. And I think I did a pretty good job. Anyway, 12 years later, I'm I'm uh, a freelance instructional designer who's uh, developing material for companies all over the world, primarily in North America. But uh, you know, I made the decision to uh, to jump to um, you know my my own sort of thing here. So uh, let's take a look at my YouTube channel. Actually, we'll just. Uh, Keep that open there. Yeah, I'm pretty proud of the work that I've accomplished. I think, you know, in, for someone who doesn't have a formal education, um, you know, in instructional design, I'm someone who fell into it by accident. Um, you know, it's one of those things that, uh, that has turned into a, a career that I'm passionate about and I enjoy a lot. Uh, going freelance about a year and a half ago was a scary decision. Um, it meant a, a bit of a cut in pay. Certainly, it didn't mean, um, well, it meant that the consistency of pay um, wasn't there. So there'd be months where there's no work, you know, and, and no one's seeking you out for, um, you know, instructional design work. And then there's other months where I have to turn jobs down. It's really kind of crazy that way because, um, you know, I'd love to be able to say yes to all of them. But when you, I, I just find that you get to a point where even if you're not busy all the time, I don't think I can manage more than about four or five projects at the same time, just because mentally it's just too much stuff. So generally, I'm usually working on two or three different projects. 
Uh, but like I said, sometimes it's not any projects at all, and that can be a little stressful. I constantly have to remind my wife, who who loves to go shopping and, and do all kinds of great things with our money, um, to take it easy sometimes. So, But uh, just taking a look at my YouTube channel, for those that don't know, um, youtube.com slash Paul David Wilson. Uh, sorry, Paul Wilson Learning. That's, what am I saying? That's the old one. Uh, so if you just remember Paul Wilson Learning, if you go to youtube.com slash Paul Wilson Learning, uh, you can find my channel. You can subscribe to my channel. Probably the most important thing for my YouTube channel is I encourage people to share it with everyone. Uh, I'm doing my best to, to share it myself, uh, either through the Adobe eLearning community or other social media methods. But it's really important that if you if you find a video that you think is really great and you really got something from it, please share it with your colleagues. Um, you know, it's really important. And it allows me to keep doing this for free um, because obviously there's ad revenue from YouTube. So um, it helps to pay for my expenses and some of my time. So I really encourage everyone to share it as much as possible and to watch as much of it as they can or they feel they need. Uh, I got a message here from Cindy, it looks like. Cindy's asking, uh, do you know if you can import a PowerPoint that has audio recorded to it and time to existing complex? Let me just see. There's, I think there's more to that message. <clears throat> and time to existing complex animations. That's what she was saying. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if Cindy's watching. This was just a comment that was posted on my, my YouTube channel itself. Um, I'm not a big fan of importing PowerPoint. I know I have a video on it. If you were to search for uh, on YouTube, um, Paul Wilson PowerPoint Captivate, you'd probably find that video with those keys, keywords. Um, I'm glad it's there. There's a lot of senior e-learning people or, or gurus or whatever you want to call them that uh, poo-poo the fact that Captivate imports PowerPoint. And I'm not one of them. I think it's actually a good feature because I think there's people like myself, um, you know, who don't use it. And that's fine. I can ignore the feature. But there's people who are just getting started with PowerPoint. People who, you know, their, their, their training manager, their learning manager has, uh, uh, you know, um, said, here's this new software, Adobe Captivate 9.0. And I need you to learn it, and I need you to get an e-learning uh, e course out there by the end of the month. And you don't know anything about it. So at least with the import PowerPoint capability, you can produce something. Um, I think that producing uh, PowerPoint after PowerPoint is a mistake. I think very quickly you should start learning something about Adobe Captivate and figure out... Um, you know what the what the next best steps for you are to to learn the tool don't just rely on importing powerpoint because you know all the bad things that people say about powerpoint are actually true there there's really some awful powerpoint out there and we fall into the trap i was one of them um i spent a lot of time developing powerpoints when we did webinars uh for the first company that i worked for and uh, those PowerPoints were those complex animations. I literally had uh, recreated the 20th Century Fox logo with the, um, the spotlights in the sky and the music in the background. I did that in PowerPoint. And um, I was able to, to convert that. I actually did that in Flash and then imported it into PowerPoint, um, and that was something I used in my webinars at the beginning, you know, just to kind of make it interactive and fun. I learned later that interactivity is something else. It's not animation. It's not music. It's not multimedia. Um, in fact, what, um, what interaction is, is uh, your users interacting with you or, in this case, the e-learning software. Um, or the courseware, if you will. So 
you know, I'm not a big fan of spending all your time developing these really awesome complex animations with multimedia and audio and video. Uh, I would rather have a solid learning, uh, a solid, solid effective learning strategy built into my e-learning rather than, you know, how cool it looks. How cool it looks is secondary. Uh, you know, I try to make my e-learning look cool. Uh, the latest trend I've been really focusing on is trying to make it look more like an app, trying to make it look more like a, a mobile application that you put on your phone or your device and, you know, working with responsive design and, and you know, allowing those images to scale up and scale down depending on screen size. Um, but, you know, without the uh, solid learning foundation, all of that stuff is just icing on the cake. So, um, but if you're just getting started, PowerPoint is a great tool for for getting e-learning started. So uh, to answer Cindy's question, yes, you can import all this stuff and it will get converted into um, basically flash animation. And um, I, I haven't tried it with HTML5 or responsive, well, I don't think it'll work for responsive design. I think you're strictly going with a standard project. And it could scale up and scale down if you if you choose the scaling option when you publish it. And I think it will take the audio. Um, it's worth trying. And uh, I think what I ran into the few times that I tried it was that the more complex the PowerPoint, you know, with, with animations and objects moving on screen and multimedia in the background, it slowed down quite a bit and sometimes would not run properly. And unfortunately, once you've imported the the complex PowerPoint into Captivate. If there's something not quite right, like the timing isn't right, like if you have audio that doesn't match the the interactions or or the the objects that are occurring on screen, um, there's really not much you could do. You, you can go back to the original PowerPoint and adjust it there, and then re-import it. Um, but once it's in Captivate, there's not much you can do with it. So I strongly encourage people to. Um, you know, I strongly encourage people to make sure that they not just import the PowerPoints the first time, but start to learn how to actually use Adobe Captivate. And not to toot my own horn, but um, if you're looking for a nice free resource, um, you know, certainly my YouTube channel provides a lot of instruction on how to take your Adobe Captivate knowledge to the next level start working with variables, start working with advanced actions, and um, and create some e-learning that, that does something that, that allows your users to interact with it. So one of the other things, um, let's see if I've got any other questions here. Video, okay, so AISDS MSU, I'm not sure who that is. Hello, on a Captivate slide, I have a video object along with an audio MP3 file. The MP3 file uh, will play automatically explaining the slide. Then the end user should play the video. The issue is the MP3 file will continue playing when the user clicks on the video play button. Is there a way to control an audio overlap? I wanna make sure that if the end user clicks on the video, that the MP3 file will stop playing. <clears throat> well, sometimes the, the simplest solution is the easiest. Um, what I would do in such a case is I would actually split that interaction into two slides. Now, those slides can look almost identical to one another. You can even have a mock-up of what the video, you know, the, the box for the video would be on the screen. And once the, once the user clicks play video, it advances to the next slide where you have, um, in this case, a multi-slide synchronized video, but not multi-slide. It would only be set for that one slide. And it would simply play in time with the rest of the project. Um, rather than trying to make it more complicated than it needs to be, that's how I would do it. And, and you'll find, as you watch my videos, if you haven't watched a lot of my videos before, you'll see that more often than not, I'm looking for the simplest solution. Um, because for me, instructional design and development is, get, you know, the shortest path from getting from A 
to point B, right? And you want to make that as short as possible. You don't want to spend your development time, um, you know, working on these complex problems. Um, you, you're much better off to come up with very simple solutions that you can implement quickly and that you don't need to spend a lot of time on development because uh, rapid development is the key nowadays. Think of it this way. If you're a, a learning and development uh, manager in a corporation or within an e-learning company, um, who do you want working for you? Do you want someone who can come up with these really complex solutions, but it takes time to build them and you know they have to write all this advanced code? And then, of course, every time you have advanced actions or code, excuse me, you need to test it. Or would you rather have someone who can take the default functionality that's built into the tool and use it to the best of, it, of their, uh, his or her ability? And I think that's who you're gonna choose. So from, from my perspective, um, I, there's nothing more powerful than delivering before the expectation um, you know, if you're working for a company and you've asked, they've asked you to develop some e-learning and you tell them it's going to take three months, well, you know, there's a very good possibility they might start shopping around for other e-learning designer developers. So I would make sure that you're, uh, you know, you're definitely, um, being competitive. Um, I'm not saying that that's what this person is running into, but again, that simple solution of putting the, the audio description, the, the audio object that explains how the, how to run the video and then the play button rather than actually playing a video separately and having the two overlap, have the play button just simply be go to next slide. And on that next slide, play the video. It's, it's such a simple solution. So. Um, I had a message from Mark. Does anyone from the chat want to, uh, I don't know, have I not given people permission to use the chat? Maybe that's the issue here. Let me just check out these controls. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything. I just want to make sure I'm not preventing people inadvertently from from adding to the chat because I think it's important that if you have specific uh, questions, let me just try something here. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm just looking at the available commands in chat. If you type in, is it backslash or slash? I can't remember which one's which. Um, let's just take a look here. Well, there's a couple of people on chat, but it doesn't look like they're asking any questions. So, um, that's fine. Um, you know, I'll continue to talk about maybe some of the other questions that I've received on my channel recently. Uh, some of these I've answered already. I know that in response to the importing PowerPoint workflow uh, video that I did, um, oh, I guess that was probably almost a year ago now. Um, I recorded that video in response to someone who who was asking how to do it. And quite frankly, I was very straight up with them. And I said, I don't do it. I know how to do it, but I don't do it. Um, again, I'm not a fan of it, but I do think that it's an important feature that Adobe has included. So uh, Mark, uh, the other day, yesterday, actually wrote thumbs up for telling people to stop relying on PowerPoint. Um, yeah, I'm with him. I agree with him. Um, if PowerPoint importing was no longer available in the next release of Captivate, it would not change my life in the slightest. But that said, I am glad it's there for, for those that are just getting started because I know what it's like to, um, to, you know, to just be handed a piece of software and say, go to it. You know, like it's, it's not easy to suddenly ramp yourself up and develop tr good training at the same time. So, um, 
So some people asking about Prime, Adobe Captivate Prime. I did a couple videos about Adobe Captivate Prime when it first came out. And um, I'm not generally using it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, I don't personally have a need for an LMS. Uh, but there certainly are people who, um, you know, who can set up or, or can take advantage of um, of having their own LMS. One of the things you can do, and if you're interested in getting your hands on free Adobe software, uh, if you haven't already signed up for an account, um, go to elearning.adobe.com. That's the the e-learning community page. And um, I, I actually blogged about this on the community page uh, earlier today, uh, and, and it's gone up. I'm not sure if it's on the home page or not, but I mean, there's certainly tons of, of content that you can read or, or view. Like that's another way you can view my videos is from the elearning.adobe.com site. But um, the blog that I did was about taking advantage of this site. A lot of people are looking for getting their hands on on uh, on e-learning software and e-learning courseware and things like that. If you actually go to the, you know, once you've signed up for an account, and you click on the little user profile in the upper right-hand corner. I'm looking on my screen, but I'll describe it as best I can. And click on your picture. If you don't have one, click on the icon that represents you. And you'll see your current status. Now, my current status is that I'm listed as a wizard. And uh, some of you might think not too highly of the gamification or gamification of of not only e-learning, but of community forums like this. Um, but uh, I'm a wizard, which means that I've accumulated, um, I'm not sure what that point is, but I've accumulated 3,260 points. Now, if I click the learn more next to my wizard badge, I can actually see the different levels. I wish I could, I don't want to turn my laptop here, but, um, yeah, I'll describe it for you. The levels are uh, newbie. There's no points required to be a newbie on the e-learning community. Um, there's explorer. That's 50 points. There's guide. That's 150 points. There's master, and that's 500 points. A uh, thousand points gets you the status of wizard, and 5,000 points gets you the status of legend. And, you know, when, when they came out with the e-learning community, I was one of the pre-release testers for e-learning community. And, uh, you know, I tested it out. And I, uh, when originally pointed out to me that, oh, they've got these, these gamification or gamification, however you want to pronounce that. I've heard it pronounced both ways uh, with badges and things like that. And I thought, well, that who cares? Who cares what people think of me or, or what my contribution has been so far? But here's the thing. When, when it went live, I was listed as a newbie. I thought, geez, I've been using Captivate for 10 years. I'm not a newbie. <laughs> I don't consider myself a newbie. And I was a little offended. And obviously, I have enough ego ego to, um, to, uh, to react to that. And, uh, of course, the solution was I filled as much content as I could on the e-learning community and got myself up to 3,000 points. And that's all nice and good and everything, and you're thinking, so what? But um, you know, one of the things that, that happens um, because of my YouTube channel, I think a lot of people think that you know, because I have a YouTube channel with 170 videos and a quarter million views and 3,000 subscribers, which is great. I appreciate all that. But it, it doesn't make you a rich man, and it certainly doesn't make you world famous or anything like that. You know, the 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 amount of people who know who I am is relatively small. Um, but one of the cool things about the e-learning community is the fact that they offer incentives for you to go up. And when people reach out to me and say, "Oh, can I intern with you?" or uh, "Can you be my mentor?" 
Um, I, you know, you can ask ask me any question on the the YouTube channel. I will do my best to answer all of them. Uh, in fact, I think to date I have I have addressed every question that's come through. And if I haven't, let me know because I will I will always do my best to to try and communicate back and forth. To me, the YouTube channel is as much yours as it is mine. But here's the cool thing. If you start to participate in the e-learning community, these guys will give you software. Now, it's for a period of time. It's a, like an extended trial, if you will. But let's say you accumulate 150 points. Now, to actually gain 150 points, I'll give you some examples of what your participation level would be to, to accumulate that. So if you posted the correct answer to questions, let's say five times, and you posted a blog post on the e-learning community, that would give you 150 points. And that would mean that you would be listed as a guide. You would be upgraded from newbie to explorer, and then from explorer to guide. So that's 150 points. What does that give you? That gives you three months of complimentary license usage of Adobe Captivate and Adobe Presenter Video Express. So free software, seems pretty good to me. And if you continue to, to work through this, you know, rather than, you know, relying on me to be your mentor or for me to, um, you know, get you to be my intern, which isn't gonna give you anything, um, you keep working your way up and let's say you become a master, that's 500 points. That's five blog posts, that's all you need to do. What you'll get is three months of complimentary license usage for Adobe Captivate, Adobe Presenter Video Express or APVE, they need a, a slicker name for that. And that would actually give you Adobe Captivate Prime as well. So you'd have your own LMS, you'd have two different ways that you could create e-learning, and the last thing is that you would get an invitation or you could possibly get an invitation to host an Adobe Live webinar. Think about what all this stuff could do. Number one, you'd gain experience with the software. It would be you know, a, a, something you could put on your resume. I have used this software. I have created e-learning. I have created um, you know, uh, video webinars. And you know, I'm familiar with how to manage Adobe Captivate Prime. I think if you had three months to work with all this software, you could get pretty good at it. And if on top of that, you also hosted an Adobe Live webinar, throw it on the resume. Uh, suddenly you start looking like, like the true e-learning master that the, the tag describes. So, pardon me. So, and I'd, I'd like to see more people involved in the e-learning community. Um, as it stands right now, there's there there are there's lots of people there, but there seems to be. Um, I could probably count on one hand the number of people who are actively involved in um, answering questions. Um, you know, and there's. Um, you know, one or two people that are that are basically moderators that that are doing all the all the uh, answering of questions. And I think that if we got if we all got more involved, I think it would be a better community. You know, because some people complain about the fact that you know competing products like Articulate, Lectora have better online presences and online communities where people share more resources and things like that. Um, it really is in our own hands. We can we can complain to the Adobe folks that they don't give us enough free stuff. It looks pretty good to me. Like I look at this list, and I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, uh, a year and a half ago, when I decided to start my YouTube channel, or two years ago, somewhere in that range, um, I had no idea what the impact was going to be. I just started making videos and sharing them and putting them on YouTube. And suddenly, um, you know, I'm on a first name basis with some of the key people at Adobe. And that's kind of cool. Like that is really kind of neat. So suddenly I'm, you know, getting emails from people from Adobe India and asking me questions like, do you have time for a quick chat? I'd like to ask your 
your opinion of the new version of Captivate. And that's cool. That's neat. And then one day someone reaches out to you and says, Paul, we're doing an e-learning conference in Washington, and we were wondering if you would like to come and speak. Oh, that's cool. Um, you know, and my first instinct might be to, uh, you know, don't mind my dogs. <laughs> my first instinct might be, well, you know, that's a to, to fly across the country or in my case from a different country into the United States and stay in a, a Washington DC hotel and obviously pay for all my expenses no no we'll cover your expenses so they pay for your flight now of course um, you know I had to pump out 150 YouTube videos and get very active in the community for that to happen but um, you know, when you when you take a look at what's required to be, you know, all these different points, when you get up to the legend status, when your involvement in the e-learning community is that high, that can include 12 months of complimentary license usage for Adobe Captivate, Presenter Video Express, Captivate Prime, complimentary invite. I'm reading this right off the site. I'm not making this stuff up. Complimentary invite, including travel and accommodation costs within the U.S., to annual Adobe e-learning events, the Adobe Learning Summit, or the Adobe e-learning conference, invitation to host live webinars, and invitation to speak at Adobe live events. So, you know, it's something that I think uh, that if you if you want to get your foot in the door within this e-learning community, this is a great way to do it. So, I think it's uh, it's important that you do that. So. And you know it's it's just getting started. They just rolled out, um, you know the uh, the e-learning community within this last year. But I think it's it's really improved a lot. They haven't just thrown it out there and expected everyone to just use it. They've they've improved it several different ways. The notifications have gotten better. Um, you know the the access to the material has gotten better. Everything seems to work better than it did when they launched it. So I'm pretty happy with it. So that would be something I'd say to everyone is like, you know, if you want to get involved in this community, the rewards are quite good. And, you know, I'm not a rich man because I've been invited to uh, speak at the Adobe Captivate uh, live events. I've been to two now. I got to go to the Washington, D.C. event, and I was at the... Uh, Adobe Learning Summit in Las Vegas last or yeah last month now and um, you know it's it's a good opportunity to meet other people within the industry you get to share ideas you get to learn and that's probably the most important thing is you get to learn something and you know I went there to present but I also sat in on several of the other sessions and uh, that, that was a great experience so I definitely think that it's worthwhile being involved in the community for sure. Um, let's see what other questions we have here. Um, so I've got someone here asking about um, background audio. They've imported a, a royalty-free song to the background of their project, and they have selected the adjust background audio volume on slides with audio and set a value of 0% to mute the music. And when I preview my project, the audio does not adjust on a slide where I've inserted a video that has its own audio. I've realized that the adjust background audio volume on slides with audio feature only works on slides with an audio track, but not on slides with inserted video clips. I need the background audio to stop, but my video is playing. Is there a way to do this? Um, so if you have background audio, like let's say for example, you wanted to put the, um, the background audio uh, to be music, for example, and you just want it playing in the background for uh, slides where there's maybe no narration or no video and things like that. Probably the easiest way to do this is that if you go to the slide properties for each slide that you want, and let me just open up my copy of Captivate here. So 
make sure I'm telling you the correct thing. And I'll just open one of my recent projects here. <clears throat> I want to make sure I give you the directions correctly. I should have clicked on a smaller project. So I've actually started to not use background audio. And uh, I had some problems getting it to work on a previous version of Captivate. So what I ended up doing is that I, I just have background music on my title slide, the first slide in my course. But rather, in the background, I just put a transparent smart shape. Usually it's like a little star or something that will jump out at me in edit mode. Uh, but won't be visible to the end user. So it's completely transparent and it has no stroke thickness. And I just attach my audio there and I my title slide is two or three minutes long, however long the, the music track is. And then my narration goes right over top of it. But if you wanted to have background audio and you had a, a slide that, that where if, if background audio has already been applied, and you also have narration or a video or anything else, what you can do is you can go to the slide level properties inspector and under the option tab where audio is located, you'll see an opportunity to check off stop background audio. And that's probably the easiest way to deal with that. And that's again, you know, like I, like I sort of always say, I stick with the the simplest uh, path between point A and point B. And this is just a checkbox. So it doesn't get any easier than that. I've literally done this before where I've had the background audio on my opening slide and I, it loops forever as long as the person stays on that, that slide. And that's another checkbox uh, under the options tab of the properties, not the properties of any object, but of the whole slide. So if you deselect everything on your slide, click on the properties panel, click on the options tab. You'll see um, the opportunity to, um, to, to either loop the existing audio or to stop background audio or both. And you can check those off. If you don't have background audio, that background audio, stop background audio option will be grayed out. So that's just definitely something that's available to you. So no one has any questions? I'm just worried that you don't have the ability to ask those questions. So I'd love to hear from the people who are on the, the, um, the video right now. Um, you know, if you've got, I see 12 viewers presently. Uh, we've had up to about 20 viewers. Some people have come and gone. That's normal for these sorts of things. But I want to make sure that, uh, that it's all available to you. I don't know if I'm doing something incorrect here. Well, if you cannot, let me just check something. Maybe I'm ignoring the, uh, where the comments might be. They could actually be on. I just want to make sure I'm not ignoring you. Yeah, I think if you were commenting within the comments of the video, um, you would be able to to comment in, in that below. Let me just take a look here. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything in the comments of the actual video itself. <clears throat> huh, there I am. So, oh, you know what? I am seeing comments now.
Okay, I apologize. I wasn't looking in the right spot. Um, okay, so let's just... Um, some compliments here. Thank you. The sound is good, obviously. I have a quick question. Captivate for modifying UI of uh, resume button that take me to the last state where I was. That's from Chandra. Uh, I have a quick question. It will be great if you could explain something on that. I am new to CP. I have a quick question in Captivate for modifying UI of resume button. I'm sorry, Chandra, I don't really understand what the question is. Uh, yes, Matthew, I found the chat. <laughs> uh, well, this is why it's an experiment. Tim says, thank you from Detroit. Uh, also, Luke says, thank you for hello. Uh, do you have suggestions on importing an avatar into Captivate and syncing the mouth movements and the text-to-speech feature? Um, I don't think I necessarily know that, but you can certainly import characters into Captivate. That's part of the assets that are available. Um, my thoughts would be... Um, if you could do that as almost a web object, so if you had, for example, if you had uh, the ability to to do that in a, in a separate tool and export that as an MP4, uh, you could certainly put that as, either as a video object or a web object. And then, of course, um, my advice would be to do it as a, as a video. Uh, because then you could at attach closed captioning to it. So I don't think there's a tool specifically for creating a, a vocalized avatar, but and Matt also says that there's a tool just for that in Creative Cloud. I forget. It's either a separate tool or it's a feature in Animate CC. I think they call it Character Animator or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's part of uh, After Effects, which is what Mark added. He checked it out. Thanks, Mark. This is a question. So I got a question from Brenda here. I've been a trainer for over 15 years and have been doing instructional design on a smaller scale. Which one of your videos do you recommend I start with? Um, I get that question a lot, and I really wish that I had the foresight uh, two years ago when I started making these videos to um, to to maybe do these in some kind of order, but I didn't. Um, I just started, you know, it started off with what did I think I wanted to see? In fact, some of my very first videos were I figured something out and then I recorded the video because I knew that I would need to do it again maybe a month from now, maybe two months from now, and I wanted to remember how I did it. So um, that was definitely um, that was definitely something that, uh, that I wish I thought of, but unfortunately it didn't. So Brenda, uh, if you're still online there, my advice would be to maybe start off with the, the Captivate 8 stuff. That's the earlier stuff. I've got them organized into playlists. Uh, I would ignore the advanced action stuff and maybe save that for later because that's a little bit more advanced. So if it's got the word advanced actions in the title or variables, probably probably stay away from those for now. You, you definitely want to do that stuff at some point. And, um, and work, work your way through all 170 of them. Um, but a lot of them were just simply people would ask me questions and, you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? And I thought, well, that would make a good video. Um, and to that point, I would like to point out that sometimes people will ask me to do videos and they'll say something like, well, I have this situation where I need to create an interaction that has uh, 14 playing cards on the screen. And when you flip them over, 
um, these pictures of different people will show up and and then I need an audio interaction to occur and it's a really complex solution. I generally don't make videos for those because those are very one of solutions. They're, they're the kind of things that, um, that not everyone else is gonna benefit by. So I really wanna try to create videos that people will watch um, you know, many people will be able to benefit by them so that, you know, everyone can learn. It's it's all about the community in my case, so. But Brenda, you know, I don't think there's really a wrong answer to your question, but, you know, you might want to just leave off anything with advanced actions until you're a little more up to speed with some of the basics. Um, and, and then go from there. Yeah, uh, Chandra has asked to, uh, I think, hear about that resume pop-up. Again, I'm not sure um, if you could explain it in different words. Resume pop-up and Captivate. I'm not sure what you're referring to, so uh, maybe try writing it out a different way. Excuse me. John says, just started starting to develop responsive design with Captivate. What do you feel are the best resources, courses to learn the tips and tri tricks of responsive design with Adobe Captivate? Um, I actually have a playlist for that, I think. Let me double check. So these are my playlists. I have a playlist uh, that's uh, working with video, uh, Adobe Captivate 9, Adobe Captivate 8. I have a playlist just on drag and drop. I have a playlist on navigation, um, working with audio, responsive design e-learning. So that's got 15 videos. I would watch everything there because A, it's free. You don't have to pay for that. It's completely free. And if you still find that, um, you know, and, and quite frankly, I'll be straight up with you as well. Uh, John, that I was learning as I was creating these videos as well. So some of the earlier videos, yeah, they're, they're, they're not all winners, let's put it that way. Um, but it's worthwhile looking up. Um, but um, the, I, think, um, I think the Adobe Captivate courses that uh, Pooja Jaising did for lynda.com uh, about a year or so ago, are really good. Um, I know she touches on responsive design. Um, Adobe has, Adobe, is it Adobe Know How? Now these are, are pay courses, yeah, adobeknowhow.com um, and in fact, there, there's a lot of great stuff here for um, Creative Cloud stuff as well. Let me just see what there is for Captivate. That's a good choice. I don't know if there's anything on, on Udemy. Uh, yeah, so there's a few few courses here. There's actually a free course from, from Pooja. Um, Pooja is my good friend. She was... Uh, one of the senior uh, learning e-learning evangelists at adobe.com. She's since gone out on her own and started her own company um, over in India. But honestly, there was no one more engaged in the e-learning community than her. Um, so she has a free course that you can take on Adobe Know How. Uh, what's new in, in Captivate 9? And it probably will touch on a few, um, you know, a, free, a few of the responsive design, but it's not, I'm sure it's not exclusively that, but also there's a couple of other free courses. There's um, Dr. Alan Partridge, uh, also a friend of mine at, uh, at Adobe. He has uh, something on Adobe Presenter Video Express. I know he's a big fan of that. I like that tool too. I'm looking forward to playing with that in the near future. So those, those are a couple of good resources. There are certainly my videos, watch them, you know, and, and, really the best teacher for this stuff is play with the the tool play with it get get some exposure and experience with it and go from there 
Um, let's see what else we have here. So Mark asked, Paul, when you were at the um, Adobe Learning Summit, did you attend the alleged preview of Captivate 10? If so, what's the scoop? I heard that they're going to include Typekit web fonts for responsive projects, but that's it. Um, yeah, so I can talk about that. I can't talk about what I don't know, obviously. Um, I don't even know it's going to be called Captivate 10. Maybe they'll call it Captivate X or something like that. Or maybe they'll switch it to Captivate 2017 or something like that. Um, typically, there are two events per year for, for Adobe, live events. Um, the concurrent um, Adobe Learning Summit is part of DevLearn, which we just just happened in Las Vegas, for those that aren't aware. Excuse me. <clears throat> of course, I'm used to making videos that I edit. You know, I don't have um, a lot of experience doing uh, live webinars, or at least no, no recent ones. So what was covered was Typekit's going to be included or possibly included. And that's the thing. When they do these sneak peeks, they always say, you know, very clearly, this is a, we're just, you know, you're just seeing some technology previews here. Uh, and like other Adobe products, uh, it may not end up in the final product. They may go a different way. They may decide that it's something entirely different. But what they showed were, was several things. <clears throat> Uh, Typekit was the first thing. So and this is a big issue. You know, when you're working in Captivate, let me just bring this up over here, and you're going to be working with fonts. If you're doing responsive design, you can get away with uh, using um, other fonts, like regular Windows fonts or regular Mac fonts, um, when you're actually working in standard or blank projects, as they're called even if you're publishing them as HTML5, because of course, uh, all that stuff gets converted to a series of images. But if you're doing responsive design, you're, you're limited to the web safe fonts. And those are, if you scroll up in your, in your list of fonts, when you're editing a, a web or, or sorry, a, um, a smart shape or a text box, you're limited to really six fonts, Arial, Courier New, Georgia, Times New Roman, Trebuchet MS, and Verdana. So that, personally, I find that really limits you, especially when your e-learning clients are asking for, oh, well, you have to use our branding, which means uh, we use this special font called Proxima Nova, and we want the rocket font for all our titles. And that's a challenge if you if you uh, up till now and if you're doing responsive design because that stuff just won't stick. You'll publish it and out comes Times New Roman or Arial or something like that when it's supposed to be something else. Um, so that's an exciting piece of news that 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 type kit will be available. And the good news is that it's not just restricted to um, the paid fonts like because type kit does include. Uh, fonts that you would essentially subscribe to and pay a fee for, but you could also use uh, quite a few of the fonts that are included for free, and that's going to apparently come out. So I'm pretty excited about that. <clears throat> the other thing was the idea that responsive design, uh, you know, as it stands today, we always use breakpoints. And breakpoints are a way of saying, you know, from, from this resolution to this resolution. And again, we're always talking from left to right. And top to bottom is fixed. But from left to right, so from this resolution to this resolution, we're going to place these objects the way they are on this breakpoint screen. And then you select a different breakpoint, and then you can change the arrangements of things. The idea with um, with this particular feature was something called magic boxes. And the idea with magic boxes was that breakpoints would go away and it would just know to organize your content in such a way that, you know, depending on the screen, 
dimensions of the of the device that you're viewing this e-learning course on or this e-learning project on uh, it would automatically arrange your content in what's the most appropriate way and the the theory is the goal is uh, to make uh, e-learning easier um, you know right now we spend probably an extra 30 percent of our time developing responsive design you know uh, traditional e-learning and I still always encourage people to do what I call a, uh, a technology needs analysis or a technical needs analysis find out what your client needs I had a, a client who wanted responsive design uh, because 12 vice presidents within the company all had iPads and they were the only one who could access e-learning from their iPads and I pointed out to them that well here's the price if you want a standard project here's the price if you want html5 and it's about 30 percent more expensive because it takes me 30 percent more time to develop responsive design so when they realized that it was just a luxury for their particular situation and i'm not saying that all situations are like theirs they're you know, you could you could be developing training for an organization that has salespeople who all have iPhone sixes, and they're expected to complete their training on their phone. Um, that would be a very different situation. But in this case here, everyone else was using PCs to do their e-learning, and these these handful of vice presidents wanted to do their e-learning on their tablets. So, I don't know if that's a really great uh, example or use of um, of company resources. So. But that said, um, from our perspective, we want this to be easy. Um, not so easy that we don't have control over how things look and how they interact with the interface, but easy so that we're not spending countless hours, you know, fixing things just for responsive design. Um, so what they demoed it was kind of a complicated demo because they were showing a series of objects that would automatically organize themselves depending on the screen resolution. And there were no breakpoints um, in this interface that they were showing. So they had sort of marks along where the breakpoint bar usually is, but not that you could select them or, or change their settings. So should be interesting to see what they do with that. I'm very curious how that will work. The demo that they did was incomplete and again this is just a, a sneak peek um trying to think what else they were showing off i think that was the main thing was that that capability and the the type kit stuff that's the stuff that sticks out in my mind um so i think what we'll probably see and just to give you a heads up like i don't know anything you know, I'm part of this sort of um, informal inner circle of people who, who get invited to test out pre-release software. I have not seen any pre-release software. Um, that said, my guess is I think Adobe would love to release either the pre-release software or the actual product in time for a spring conference. Last year, the, the e-learning conference in Washington, D.C. was held, I think it was May 15th or May 16th or May 17th, somewhere around that. It's one-day conference. It's really quick. That would be a great time to release Captivate 10 or whatever it's going to be called, um, or at the very least, a, an, an announcement of what date that product will come out. Um, Usually they just go live. They don't really say oh, a week from now this will come out because they don't want to interfere with existing sales. So, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see. But again, I don't know anything, but I think it's going to make responsive design easier and, and give you more options. I'm trying to recall if there was something else. I felt like there was three things. Maybe I can add something to the comments in the video if I can remember it later, but uh, it's definitely going to be exciting, I think. <clears throat> okay, Chandra, I see that you, I have a quick question in Captivate for modifying UI of resume button. I don't know what you mean by resume button. I 
Um, yeah, I think well, Mark threw out the idea that you can use the smart shape as a button for options to change user experience of resume pop-up. I don't know what that is. Change colors and font by preferences, but that's in the app. Only other way to modify would be to modify the published project source. Uh, Christian Rodriguez asks, uh, can you explain how to implement a project into a website? Uh, not how to publish the project in Captivate, more like what you do with that compressed file. Um, sure, yeah, I can cover that off. Uh, first of all, there's a couple of videos that, that sort of explain it a little bit. Um, but um, the short answer is, um, you need to create a web space, whether it's, uh, um, you know, Squarespace, GoDaddy, or something like that. You, you need a website, or, or if you have access to an already existing um, web server, you can upload your content to that. You may have to partner with your IT department to get the full details of, on what those requirements are. Uh, but generally, what I use is uh, FTP software. And um, you know, if I just click on the start button on my computer here, yeah, I use a, a free application called FileZilla, which is spelled like Godzilla, but instead of God, it's File, FileZilla. And um, you know, it splits your screen down the middle. And um, on one side, you've got your local source files, or maybe it's this way for you guys. You got your local source files here, no, it's this way. Got your local source files here, and then you've got what the web server has. And what you need to do is simply select all of this. You don't want to zip those files up if you're publishing to uh, a zip, and you also don't want e-learning turned on if you're not using a learning management system. Uh, so you publish your course to a folder, you select all of those files, and you simply place them uh, onto the web server. Couple things to keep in mind. Um, if you have a Squarespace account, there is unfortunately no easy way to upload your content to a Squarespace account. I've had to, um, I have a sample project um, on my Squarespace account, and the only way I could publish it was as a flash file. So if you publish your course as SWF, uh, the only thing you can publish with Squarespace is one single file at a time. So you could upload the uh, SWF file that's associated with your course. You'll find that in the published folder, and it's usually quite a large file. Um, because my clients have different needs, I also have another uh, web space with GoDaddy, and that is where I use the FileZilla application to transfer all of my content. But the key thing is when you publish it, turn off e-learning because it's not going to work with a web server. That only works with the learning management system. And uh, publish it. You don't need to zip it up. Just publish it to a folder. So uncheck the zip option when you're publishing. And then use something like FileZilla. Uh, there's... There's other FTP software out there, but I use FileZilla because it's... I'm just used to it. It's not that it's better than anything else. And it's also free. So I, I like free. Um, and, and check my, my videos. I think I've got a couple of recent videos where I explain how to do that. And it might be a little bit better than just me talking about it. You'll get to see my screen and how I did that. I see Chandra's still trying to, she, she, is it she or he? Is it he? It's he. Sorry, Chandra. Um, I'm stopped in this for the last two or three days and looking for options. Again, I don't understand what you're trying to do. Uh, I don't understand resume. To me, uh, there is no default resume function. There is the play pause control in the play bar. Um, but if you can explain it differently, um, and maybe that's why you're having trouble finding an answer. Is if you could explain it in different terms, maybe we can help you out here. 
Can you mix different themes and aggregator? Um, Krishna, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, mix different themes and aggregator. Do you mean change elements of themes? Don't know what you mean. If you mean change different elements, you certainly can edit a theme. That's not a problem. And actually, I have a video about that. You also could... Um, you could also combine multiple e-learning projects together using, um, I've not used Aggregator, um, but I've used the Adobe SCORM, what's it called? I don't use it often. I generally don't combine courses together. Um, the Multisco, the Multiscope Packager, which comes with uh, each version of Captivate. So if I publish um, one course, one project, as, and it uses a particular theme, and then I publish a second project that, you know, maybe it's part two, but it uses a completely different look and feel, I could package those together. Um, but I've never really thought about combining themes together. I suppose you could make a custom theme that includes the elements from two different themes and apply them to different slides as you need them. Uh, but um, interesting question. Um, I zipped SCORM packages for my LMS. An error message appeared, incorrect file package, missing uh, LMS manifest.xml or AICC structure. Do you have a video on how to SCORM and transfer modules to an LMS? Uh, the first thing I would do uh, with with a project that you're trying to publish for an LMS is I'd probably test it out with SCORM Cloud. If you're using Adobe Captivate 9, um, you have the opportunity to uh, publish. If you click on the Publish drop-down icon from, sorry, the Preview drop-down icon from the toolbar in Captivate, and preview in SCORM Cloud. Make sure that everything is working with SCORM compliancy first before you publish and, and upload it to your LMS. If it works in SCORM Cloud, generally speaking, uh, if you publish it with uh, e-learning turned on and all the, the, the functions, um, so when you publish to computer and you're intending to go to a learning management system, choose all the appropriate files You'll see on that page that published a computer window. Um, you should see an option for under the more tab, uh, e-learning output. If it's disabled and you package that, even if you're packaging it with with SCORM in mind, uh, there's no there's going to be no e-learning output enabled. So um, that's not going to work with an LMS. So make sure that you've uh, if you've got that and it says e-learning output disabled, click on the disabled and it will open up your preferences window and take you down to the quiz reporting section and make sure that um, quiz is enabled, reporting for this project, and you're going to need to choose the appropriate settings for your learning, learning management system. If you have a, an LMS coordinator or someone in IT that looks after that for you, you can partner with them and make sure the settings are correct for your learning management system, and that should work. But I don't have a great deal of experience with LMSs. I'm mostly just a, a designer developer, but I've, I've been around the block enough times. Oh, I think I know what Chandra's talking about here. Um, I finally figured it out. Well, it looks like Mark figured it out, actually. Launch cap, so can runtime dialogues. Yeah, there's not much you can do with those, unfortunately. Um, Mark is correct if you go into the preferences window. And um, because those those interfaces are, are sort of based on a kind of a JavaScript pop-up. And there's only so much customization that you can do. So if you go into the Edit drop-down menu mm -hmm. and hit Preferences, alternatively, you can hit Shift F8. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm not thinking that I made the same mistake as Mark. If you go into the Edit drop-down menu and Shift F7, which is the Object Style Manager, and I think if it's the it's the very last option, 
and you've got this uh, runtime dialogue, if that's what you're referring to, Chandra, you can change some of the colors, you can change the font. Uh, unfortunately, you don't have a great deal of control over that because that's something that's occurring outside of Captivate. Uh, so you just have very limited controls there. So, um, and Mark's giving feedback to Christian about embedding CP in an iframe. Um, that might solve Christian's question there. Do you want to resume? Yeah, I think that's what I think that's what Mark is referring to, Chandra. I don't. Um, do you want to resume? Um, it looks like not that mom DIY. <laughs> that's a great name. I have not looked through all your videos, but have you done one on branching? Um, off the top of my head, I don't know if I've got one that's, I, I touch on branching, I know at least in one or two videos. Um, really, it's, um, uh, I think in one case, uh, I do a video where I explain how you can have two different quizzes. Um, I did one course where I did branching. Um, for, uh, and this had to do, it was actually when I worked for the Toronto airport and there's terminal one and there's terminal three and they've got employees for each one. They're, they're separate from one another and they have different procedures. So I did, developed a course where I had, um, I had um, two different trainings that were very similar, uh, but one or two differences. So what I did is I had the course start off, you know, sort of in, in one path. And then we came to a decision where I displayed to them, um, you know, if you work in terminal one, go here. If you work in terminal two, uh, three, go here. There's no terminal two, they tore it down. And so then it, it simply go to this slide or go to that slide. And that's as complicated as it needs to be. And then at the end of the course, it, it, it returned return them back together. The key thing, it's actually a very simple thing to do, is in your preferences window, shift F8, um, under quiz settings, you'll see a checkbox called branch aware. Now, branch aware is important if you're going to ask people two different quizzes. And I have a video about that, so I know for sure you can watch that video. Um, branch aware really is not as not important if um, if you're not going to be using different quiz questions, but if there are different quizzes for, let's say, the the example of people who work in two different buildings, um, but you know, generally the training is mostly the same. Uh, you can split them off give them two different pieces of content and then have them complete two different quizzes at the end of the course. But you don't want them to not pass the course because they skipped all these other quiz questions. Now I'm showing you in a very three dimensional way that you take them down different paths, but in the end, all your slides are still gonna be in a single order. So you might have slide one here and then slide two Slide two might be the branch point where if you work in a different location, you go to slide 27, and that's where the second branch occurs. And then the first branch continues with three, four, five, six, seven, until it gets to 26. And then maybe it jumps to a final quiz results slide. But check for that. If you, if you uh, type in on Google branch, Adobe Captivate, Paul Wilson, you'll probably find that video um just through you know the keyword search but yeah it's on it's actually within your preferences window quiz settings is the subcategory and if you look down there you'll show you'll see a little checkbox for branch aware check that off and people will only get marked correct or incorrect for the quiz questions that they physically see 
uh, if they're, they're skipping past a bunch of quiz questions that are intended for a different audience, uh, they won't get penalized for not, not answering those questions. That's the key thing. Uh, and I think there's a few other videos where I talk about um, advanced um, advanced action. No, sorry, that's not the right word. Let me open up a new window here. Let's do a blank project. I got to figure out a way I can do this, you know, so you can see my Captivate and see my video at the same time. Or if I could stream, do a live stream stream that, because you know you really don't need to look at my face. I mean, who cares? Uh, what would be better if I could show you um, what's happening on my screen? Uh, yeah. So if I'm building a quiz or a knowledge check, let's add do a knowledge check, and I choose a multiple choice question. And I add that to that, I can actually do branching with the individual answers that are available. So if I have answer one and answer two, and if I click on the properties, like if I click on the actual answers in my multiple choice questions and go to the options tab of my properties panel, not the quiz panel, but the properties panel, there's a checkbox for advanced answer option. If I check that off, you can set a different action for each answer within a quiz question. And that action can be go to this slide. If I choose this answer, go to this slide. If I choose that answer, go to this different slide. And if I choose a third option, go to a completely different slide. And that allows you to you know, allow people to make decisions and almost do a choose your own adventure thing. There's a video about that and look for advanced answer option. Um, let's see if I can find it for you. And that would also be available in the playlist that I call uh, working with questions, I think. Yeah, working with question slides. There are 53 videos in there. There's a lot of stuff covered in question slides, obviously. But if you looked at that playlist, and let's see if I can find the exact title name um, that, that deals with that, because that's a neat feature. A lot of people don't know about it, because when you're working with quiz questions, converting player. Yeah, so the branching, the branching uh, video, the first one I mentioned, two quizzes in one Captivate module, Adobe Captivate eLearning free tutorial. Uh, that's that's available. That talks about branching there, and the other one that we were going to look for here. Actually, it might be easier if I just search for my from from my video. You get to a point where there's just so many videos. I obviously want to keep doing them, but it becomes increasingly more difficult to to find these. Um, trying to search advanced answer captivate. Yeah, so the, the title of the video is Create Branch Scenarios Using Advanced Answer Options, uh, Adobe Captivate eLearning free tutorial. Um, so that's definitely available as well. So not that mom DIY, there's your answer. <laughs> uh, do you have any recommendations for testing for LMS if you're using Captivate 8? That's from Heather. I'm not sure what you mean. <clears throat> um, testing for LMS if you're using Captivate 8. Do you have any recommendations for testing for LMS if you're using 
uh, Captivate 8. Well, I think what you're referring to, Heather, is the fact that there um, there is not a preview in SCORM Cloud feature like there is in 9, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think that was an addition to 9. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about SCORM Cloud, if you go to scormcloud.com, you can sign up for a very basic limited account where you can upload one course. So while Captivate 9 has the ability to preview directly from the drop-down um, drop down item, um, the preview, preview drop-down icon, uh, you can still do the same thing in Captivate. You just have to do it a little more manually. So what you could do is you could publish your course with your uh, with SCORM 1.2, uh, SCORM 2004, and I think they'll even accept, uh, don't quote me on this, but maybe XAPI as well, which is also known as Tin Can. Uh, and you should be able to upload those to SCORM Cloud. Now, they are limited in file size. So unlike the preview in Captivate, you can pretty much upload and test anything. But with uh, with a basic SCORM Cloud account, I think it has to be, I'm not sure, maybe 20 megabyte files. So you might have to save a, a limited version of your project to see if it works. Uh, maybe just the quiz questions uh, and then leave the content out because uh, generally content will work with any learning management system. But um, if you publish just your quiz questions and your quiz results slide into uh, a very simple package and then upload it to a basic SCORM Cloud account, um, the, the free ones give you the ability to have one user, which is just yourself, I guess. And it's certainly enough to find out if all your scoring and your quiz results are reporting as you would be expected. So I've used that before in previous versions of Captivate, so it shouldn't be a problem. <clears throat> you mentioned, and so yeah, you mentioned using SCORM Cloud. Yeah, that's, so that's what you do. Just go to scormcloud.com and um, sign up for a free account, and you're, you're able to upload single courses and of course you can delete them once you're once you've tested them and uh and that goes goes from there it's pretty straightforward um but yeah this is just stuff that i figured out over the years you know when i first started i didn't know about scormcloud.com and what's good about scorm cloud is that these are the people who literally came up with scorm so it's not like you're going to um, have something that doesn't work properly. This is, if it works on SCORM Cloud, it will work on any truly SCORM compliant learning management system. So that should do you. So it looks like I've come to the end of the chat. I apologize to everyone that I didn't know where to look for the chat. I thought it was here on my Google Hangouts window, but apparently it's actually within the YouTube interface. So uh, I'll know that for next time. So this is a really good First experiment, we're probably about an hour and a half into this uh, this live stream. Um, I'll give you an opportunity to ask any other questions. Uh, if you aren't already subscribed to my channel, I, I really strongly encourage you to subscribe because that way you'll receive notifications each time I put up a new video. I think I'm at 177. There might be some hidden videos. Not sure. Let's see what, what you see. Yeah, it's quite a few. It's 170 something anyway. And um, obviously, uh, you know, the more you watch, the, 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 the better it is for me, obviously. But I think what's what's more important is that you share these videos with your other colleagues out there. Uh, again, one of the biggest complaints I've heard within the Adobe Captivate community is that there's not enough free resources. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do. I mean, obviously, I'm trying to build a reputation within the e-learning industry and, and hopefully get some jobs because of my, uh, my expertise. Um, you know, certainly if, uh, if you're not at a point like if you're new to Adobe Captivate and you're new to e-learning and you're not comfortable um, maybe diving into your first e-learning project, hire me. I, I'm available for hire. I am an instructional designer who works like everybody else. I'm not 
just a YouTube guy, you know, <laughs> in fact, the YouTube thing is just a secondary thing for me. Um, and obviously you can follow me also on Twitter. I tend to post all my videos there. So if you don't want to sign up for a Google account or you want to stay off of YouTube, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Paul Wilson LD as in learning design. Um, I have an Instagram account where I also post the latest videos that I've done. Um, uh, that's my Instagram profile name is Paul David Wilson, my full name with my middle name, David as well. And, uh, I'm also on Google plus, but if you're on Google plus, you'll also be on YouTube. So that's fine. And I think I have a Facebook page too. You can probably find me on Facebook. Just type in Paul Wilson learning or something like that. I don't know what my actual address is for Facebook. So. So I think that's it. Unless anyone has any further questions, it looks like we've come to the end of the questions on the chat. Um, I apologize for the video quality. We're just using my webcam in my laptop. Maybe I've got a DSLR over there, but I couldn't figure out how to hook it up to the laptop and have it stream live. So maybe for the next video, we'll have that. But once again, I want to thank everyone for uh, for joining. It's uh, kind of cool to have um, a face-to-face, -face, or sort of a face-to-face, -face, but uh, rather than just anonymously watching my videos, which I don't really get to get a lot of interaction from. But if you have ideas for videos that you'd like to see in the future, just pick a video, put the comments in the video, and um, you know, I'll I, I address almost every single question that people ask. Um, so even if you have a question that doesn't warrant a video, I'll probably answer it. Um, I generally, um, have positive interactions with most people and, you know, I share your ideas with everybody else. So, uh, you know, I really like it to be a, a real community. So I hope you guys enjoy my, my channel and hope you got some value out of today's, uh, live stream. So I'm going to sign off now. See you next time.